Bună dimineața și de la mine în această dimineață de a treia zi de festival. Astăzi începem ziua cu o discuție care mie mi se pare foarte importantă, aproape, aproape critică pentru momentul în care suntem. Este o discuție despre pedagogie și o discuție despre de ce pedagogie înainte de tehnologie. Și uh, mie mi se pare că avem cel mai potrivit invitat care să ne ajute să discutăm acest subiect. Vorbim despre asta pentru că anul 2023, din anumite puncte de vedere, nu este neapărat un an ca oricare altul. Este un an când aplicații de inteligență artificială au ajuns să fie accesate de sute de milioane de oameni. Este un an când, de exemplu, Snapchat a introdus ideea de prieten de inteligență artificială utilizatorilor lui, în general adolescenți. Este un an când clasele noastre devin din ce în ce mai tehnologizate, apar din ce în ce mai multe table inteligente, apar din ce în ce mai multe software-uri, apar din ce în ce mai multe aplicații. Uneori e și foarte mult zgomot și discuțiile despre câtă tehnologie ar trebui să folosim în clasă sunt foarte polarizate. Așa că înainte să descoperim, nu știu, tehnologiile care sunt disponibile pentru clasă, am zis că trebuie să facem puțină ordine. Și pentru noi, această ordine și această stea a nordului, când vine vorba de tehnologie, este întotdeauna pedagogia. Um, înainte să trec mai departe către invitatul nostru, o să fac doar câteva anunțuri în limba română și apoi voi trece la limba engleză. Ca de obicei, colegii mei vor pune în chat padăturile de festival ca să le aveți îndemână, mai ales dacă vă vor veni în minte reflexii legate de această sesiune și după această sesiune. Nu uitați că ne puteți întâlnite întrebări și reflexii în chat um, sau în altă formă de Q&A care va fi disponibilă pe tot, tot parcursul, pe tot parcursul acestei sesiuni și vă încurajăm să facem acest lucru. O să păstrăm câteva minute la sfârșit, dar nu foarte multe pentru întrebări. Ați remarcat sau veți remarca în curând de îndată ce voi trece la engleză că această sesiune este tradusă cu un instrument automat, un instrument de inteligență artificială de traducere, ca și sesiunea cu Fiona Kirkland. Este imperfect, <laughs> dar funcționează destul de bine și este de foarte mare ajutor. Așa că, pentru că asta este disponibil, o să termin cu aceste anunțuri în limba română și I will switch to English. So, for me personally and also for our organization, it's a great joy to have us here, um, our keynote guest in this festival, uh, Oli Bray, currently Strategic Director at Education Scotland. Um, Education Scotland is a Scottish government executive agency charged with supporting quality and improvement in Scottish education. I'm sure Oli will tell you more about it. Um, the work he does is uh, absolutely, you know, it's nothing short of amazing. <laughs> um, and for here, uh, for us here, is it's extremely relevant because uh, he has worked so much in this uh, very tight spot between pedagogy, playful learning, and uh, and technology. For the last 25 years, Oli has had the various leadership roles at this intersection in various Scottish and international organizations. He is an award teacher. He is um, a former head teacher, a former global director at Global Foundation. I think, um, I don't know, from between most of us here, I think he has most of, the most experience in dealing with this uh, very problematic thing sometimes, which is how do you combine actually technology and pedagogy? So, uh, Dear Oli, thank you so much for uh, being here with us this morning and accepting this uh, invitation and so quickly. I was you, you have no idea how happy I was the moment you <laughs> you answered back on LinkedIn. I think I called my mother also because <laughs> like I was I was very very excited and I was like ah somebody answered. Um so thank you so 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 much. Um, some thousand teachers are already uh, logged in with us and they are <laughs> they are coming, uh, they are joining the minute uh, we are speaking. So, um, yeah, we're looking forward to, to your presentation and uh, welcome. Great. Well, well, thank, thank you, Eleanor, and, and, and thank you to everybody that's that's joined us this, this morning. It's a it's really a, a genuine delight to, to be able to, to, to join you and um And you, you said that you were surprised that I reply quickly. Now, I, I always reply quickly to things where you've got teachers uh, volunteering, you know, to come together to yeah. learn about technology, to learn about learning, 
to try and deliver things in the classroom, which is going to benefit, you know, children and young people. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Now, let me just see if I can share my screen and you can maybe tell me yep. uh, whether that's working or, or not. On my side, I'm very happy we have a good crowd for uh, pedagogy. Yes, it works perfectly. Thank you. That's that's great. <laughs> OK, well, if, if that's OK, then I'll just I'll just I'll just start my presentation and then we'll have the chance, I think, for some questions yes. at the end. So, um, yes. Good, mo Thank you. good morning again, everyone. Hopefully the uh, the translation is working OK. I'll also try to speak a little bit slower than normal because I tend to get very, very excited about these things. I'm hugely passionate about um, technology. I'm hugely passionate about children and young people. and I'm hugely passionate about where children and young people meet technology to create really quality you know, learning experiences. Um, there's probably lots of things that we could um, talk about this morning. Um, and I'm really happy to to share these slides with, with, with Eleanor for dissemination afterwards, or I can put a link online for people to use them. But um, this is roughly, you know, what I'm going to talk, want to talk about. I'm going to think a little bit about what the future holds. I think that's an important thing for us to think about at the moment as educators. And think about the different types of technology that we might use uh, in our homes, in, in industry, in schools. Think a little bit about digital transformation, you know, and, and how do we actually transform you know, our schools into positive learning environments. And to do that, I think that's thinking a little bit about technology in learning. And I will explain a little bit more uh, about that when we get there. And I'm going to touch on quickly this idea of building strong digital communities, uh, partnerships really between teachers, children, young people, parents, and how we get around that. Uh, we'll think a little bit then about kind of practical pedagogies and, and actually what are we trying to do with the technology to improve learning. Uh, and then I'd like to sort of finish up by perhaps talking a little bit about creativity and, you know, and, and getting the basics right. Because, of course, one of the titles for this presentation was, you know, was, was really around, you know, artificial intelligence and thinking a little bit about um, the pressures of artificial intelligence. But actually, one of the things that I want to try and get across during this presentation is that AI is a thing. <laughs> There's lots of presentations on AI during, during, during this festival, but it's not the only thing. And it's also not the most important thing, particularly for learning and particularly for learning for, for young children as well. And I think it's important we don't get distracted, you know, sometimes by these powerful technologies. So just a, a, a few kind of quick thoughts, I suppose, in terms of what's on my mind. Like many countries in the world at the moment, you know, Scotland is going through periods of change. It's going through periods of education reform. Um, I do a lot of work, obviously, in Scotland. That's my main job, but a lot of international work, you know, as well. And I think post-pandemic, many, many countries are thinking about education and is education fit for purpose? We've learned a lot during the pandemic in terms of online learning. Uh, in some places, that was more successful than, than others. Let's just be honest about, about that. Um, but in many, many places, um, the use of online and digital technology has unlocked opportunities for children as well. So for me, I always think about how do we take some of the best things and some of the best learning during the pandemic where it worked well? How do we take some of the best things that worked well in systems before that? And how do we try and create, you know, new models of learning? And I worry, you know, a little bit at the moment because in some systems, in some governments, people are defaulting to exactly what we had in the past rather than trying to reimagine, you know, what we've got. And I think that's an important challenge for all of us as educators. Now, as I was sort of, you know, thinking about this, I was thinking a little bit about the future. And I'll maybe just start off with um, three very, very quick cartoons ar around this, which um, have come from uh, have come from media, you know, in, in, in the past. Uh, and there's a point to kind of all these things. So the first cartoon, which hopefully you can see now, is a is an old classroom. Um, and, um, you know, you, you've got kids with these kind of headphones on, on, on them. And you can see that there's the, the school teacher, the head teacher over on the right hand side. And um, they put uh, books, you know, into into a, into a wood chipper around that. And the books are being, you know, char charged around and all of that knowledge is coming out of the books and it's being you know, beamed, you know, into the children's minds. Now, there's a couple of interesting things about this picture. So you'll notice that um, uh, up in the in the very top part of the picture, the date is 2000. That's the year 2000. So that was a, an idea about what some people thought education might look like when this cartoon appeared uh, in the Reader's Digest in 1910 ar around that. So very, very interesting how that did. And then I think, you know, to 
other things in popular culture. This is a, uh, a screenshot from a very popular cartoon, certainly in the UK and in, 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 the, in, in the US. It was called The Jetsons. It was kind of, you know, the sister show to the Flint, Flint, Flintstones. And this was projected in, in 1963. And again, projecting this idea that young people are being taught by robots, all, all of these different things. It's interesting because we've still got the kind of the blackboard there and all these different things. But again, different things. And we can move on to then, I suppose, the early 1980s now where um, Atari... Um, you know, a, a big video games manufacturer at the time making games consoles, you know, at, at, at the time, some of the early games consoles, you know, imagined that that young people, you know, in, in the future would all learn um, through games based learning, you know, on in, on in, on individual screens. And you can see that they're all using, you know, joysticks, you know, around that as well. And I suppose the point, folks, that I'm sort of trying to make here is that we're quite often uh, better at getting predictions about the future wrong than we are about getting the future right around that. Uh, and that's OK, I think, as long as we learn from, uh, learn from it. And I think the important thing here is that let's not worry too much about the future. Let's worry about what we've got within our control now, within our classrooms, within our schools. And how can we use technology you know, to really make an impact? Now, this is not to say that there aren't at the moment quite huge technology drivers that are impacting on all of our lives. And of course, one of the challenges that we have in many countries, and I'm imagining that Romania is exactly the same here, is that quite often young people have got exposure to quite advanced technologies at home and in their local communities, but not always at schools. Uh, and that can sometimes cause, cause a tension um, between the home environment, the community environment and actually what's going on in schools. So I'm not ignoring any of these technologies because I think that they are imp 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 important, but we don't necessarily always have to have these technologies in, in, our, in our school. It really depends on what we're trying to do around, 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 around things. Um, and I suppose just with uh, linked into that within my sort of op opening remarks is that I think we just need to be thinking a little bit carefully about the types of technologies that we will invest in. So I do think, for example, though we're not going to talk about it today, I do think that things like artificial intelligence and chat GBT, because it is so available to young people, is going to have an impact on how young people learn. And therefore, I think it's important to teach about it in schools and where possible, get young people to use it in schools in a responsible way. Um, other you know, big media headlines at the moment, certainly, you know, in the, in the UK and I'm sure in other parts of the world is around the metaverse and virtual reality and walking avatars and all of these things. And I do think that that technology will come eventually, but it's certainly not going to come tomorrow or the next day or the next time. And the reason for that, of course, is because the, the cost of actually being able to do that is incredibly expensive, you know, to provide every young person with a headset and other things. So this will be a technology that exists for a long period of time. Um, you know, in the uh, entertainment space, uh, in the industry space around sort of training, but it will not make it into mainstream schools for a long period. ChatGBT, on the other hand, I can get that on my phone. You know, it's free. Uh, young people have already got exposure to this. So this is a technology that we need to think a little bit about, you know, a little bit more. And the reason that I, I mentioned that is because I think that sometimes, and this happens to really, really passionate teachers quite a lot, teachers that are really enthusiastic, is they get seduced by the shiny things they get seduced by the new technologies that are coming down the pipeline uh, and they try and take these technologies and they try and use them in schools without actually necessarily thinking about what are these technologies used for you know, in the first place. So for me, um, when I think about technology in schools and there's been lots of different presentations later today and yesterday as well about different types of technologies and how they might be used. It's all about how do we use appropriate technologies or, or, appropriate, or appropriate tools. So, so for example, um, this is a, a picture here. You can see that on the screen. If I, was, if I was wanting to put this picture up in my in my office or my, or my school, um, I would probably use a hammer and nail to be able to do that. Um, I, I could use a chainsaw, um, but actually the chainsaw is a completely inappropriate technology to be able to do it. Now I could do it with a chainsaw around that, but it's over-engineered and the purpose, you know, is, isn't there. So for me, it's about how do I think about what I'm trying to do. In this case here, put up a picture. And what's the most appropriate tool to be able to do that as efficiently as possible? And if you look carefully at the picture, you know, you'll see some interesting things on there, because let's imagine that um, I was teaching, you know, a group of young people about the importance of the rainforest, you know, or the importance about nature. Now, an appropriate tool might be to go outside or to take the children outside and to gather some leaves and to use the leaves and to learn about the leaves. And there's all sorts of learning that could come from that. Um, 
but there's aren't many rainforests in Scotland. So if I was actually teaching about the rainforest, then actually I might need to use a picture, you know, of a leaf that you might find in the rainforest to be able to do to do that. Or if I was wanting to take that experience a little bit further, I might want to use a video of what things look like, or I might even just want to play the sound behind it so that I could get the children to imagine the different sort of sounds and the feelings that you might get in the rainforest. And I might move sideways at this point and actually use this environment I've created using these sounds as a context for children to do a bit of creative writing or a bit of poetry, you know, or to inspire some artwork. It's not always got to be directly related, related to the individual learning outcomes. And if I had the technology and if I moved to it straight away, then actually I might be able to use a virtual headset, actually take young Kit Pilgrim to the rainforest and, and, and expose it. But the interesting thing about this sequence here is that actually that first part of the sequence, going out and picking the leaves and holding the leaves, is probably as powerful as that complete immersive experience as well. And what I worry about sometimes is that people go to the high technology part of it without thinking about how do we build the learning up over time. And of course, building the learning up over time is in essence, you know, good pedagogy, using the right tools at the right time to drive these learning outcomes. And I talk about this a lot, and, I, and I've talked to this about this a lot, like over over, over 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 time, is that one of the reasons that I think that we sometimes over engineer technology experiences is that we talk a lot about technology for learning. Uh, and again, you'll you, you'll see this in your in your in your own schools, like over the last 10 years, 20 years or, or so, we've got more technology, you know, in, 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 in schools. So if we went back 20 years, we might not have had a computer lab, for example, we might not have had a computer in each in each, in each classroom. We might not have had a projector around that. But as time has moved on, we've got more technology you know, in, in, in schools because we've thought that's the right thing to do. Um, but the, 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 the link between the technology and learning hasn't always caught up with it. We've introduced the technology and then we thought, right, how do we now use this technology for learning rather than thinking about the learning first and then selecting the most appropriate you know, technologies to learn? So I think that we're in an interesting space where we're really moving around between technology for learning, you know, and technology in learning. And of course, one of the challenges of introducing just technologies into the school without thinking about the learning first is that we try and get the technology to do old things using old thinking rather than reinventing actually what the technology can do. And I like to just illustrate that with a quick example of an online meeting. This is a really expensive online meeting system, you know, around, around, around this. And I'm, you know, and, and obviously it's been transformed now because of Teams. But what's interesting about my work that I do, and I spend a lot of time now on Teams meetings, is that these Teams meetings quite often are an hour long, and then I go into a next hour long team meeting or a next hour long team meeting. Now, the reason, of course, that meetings are an hour long is because in the past, you might have had to travel an hour or a day to get to the hour long meeting. So if you traveled for an hour to get there and the meeting was only five minutes, you know, you'd be quite angry about that. You would say it wasn't a very good use of the time. So we stretched the length of meetings over time. And now our online diaries reflects that. Whereas actually, of course, you can still meet for an hour over the course of a week, but you could do it in four 15 minute sections or you could do it in a half an hour section or two 15 minute sections. But again, the technologies sometimes are driving our behaviors rather than think us thinking about what behaviors do we want to see what's the most efficient way how do we get the technology to be able to support us you know, in, do, in doing that i think there's also you know different stages at the moment like in terms of technology trans, 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 transformation you know as things move as, as things as things move, move move on you know we've moved if you like from this kind of you know quite traditional you know in, industri industrial age um, into a into a into an automatic a a age, and we're kind of now, I suppose, in the middle part of this diagram, where many many countries are in the world are kind of in the in the in the access a in the access age, and, and by that I mean is that most young people now are starting to have access to technology. Um, now that might not be one to one technologies in schools, but many many young people now across the across the world, certainly when they get to a certain age, you know, have now at least got a smartphone and have got access to quite powerful technologies um, within 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 that as well. So we are. I suppose, moving through these different uh, stages of technology transformation. So what's my point? Well, my point is here is that I think that we need to move from a system from what I call technology for learning. Here's the technology. How are we going to use it for learning? And we need to move more to what I would call technology in learning. And this is where we think about the learning first. And then we think about how the technologies will support or support it. Um, Sorry, it's got a message again. Oh, 
Oh, there we are. I think that's that solved it now. I think we had a message on there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we need to move to this message around technologies, you know, in, in learning. And again, broadly, I think that we can classify tools, you know, into different into different things. So we can have, for example, technology tools which support productivity. And some examples of this might be um, Office 365 or Google Workspace. I think that we can have uh, tools then that support how do we create with technology. Um, this might include some of the, the playful tools that we've talked about earlier, you know, games design tools, things like Scratch, Scratch Junior, Minecraft, tools like this. And then also, I think we can think a little bit about the creative use of technology. And um, this is where, you know, we're using different technology tools and we're taking this into the domain of other other subjects and other subject areas. And um, Eleanor was telling me a really nice story before before we came on from one of the workshops yesterday about you know, the use of uh, digital video and slow motion in, in, phys in physical education, and then how that was being used to analyze, you know, the different sort of sports results. So the creative use of technology to drive these different sort of learning outcomes. So productivity, creating within creative use of important thing. Now, again, I think that quite often in education, we focus a bit too much on the productivity, right, rather than the creating with and rather than the creative use of, uh, of, of that as well. So again, these are just some important things, I suppose, for us to sort of think about. So when we're thinking about technology in, in, learn, in learning, then, and people often ask me this question a lot, and they say, well, how do we, how do we improve learning outcomes, what we're trying to do here? I often just sort of say, well, we need to strip this back to how do we improve learning? So if we're trying to improve what happens in the classroom, we need to understand how we improve learning first. Now, there are different ways you know, to, improve, to improve learning, depending on age, stage, context, et cetera. Um, and, the cognitive science you know around this has got more advanced in recent times um and there are different viewpoints on this but the one thing of course that most people can agree on is that one of the things that can improve learning in classrooms is feedback um, and this is supported by the likes of professor dylan williams professor john hattie um, around this via meta-analysis and studies for many many years so one interesting thing to think us to think about as teachers if we're wanting to improve learning in the classroom we think about how do we use the technology to improve feedback and if we're using the technology to improve feedback, then again, all of the research would suggest that we can actually use the technology to improve learning. Um, and there are many ways. There are many ways that we could do that. Um, we could do that, for example, uh, you know, by uh, being able to leave sort of comments on electronic essays, being able to leave voice comments on, on electronic, electronic essays, being able to assess in real time, uh, you know, using Microsoft Forms or Google Forms or algorithms. And we can use other software for this as well. And this is just one. Uh, you know, Duolingo, uh, you know, very, very popular sort of language learning app, um, you know, across 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 Europe and most of the nor northern hemisphere now, um, uh, pretty much free to use. And what's really interesting about Duolingo is that you can set tasks for your class and you can start to kind of quickly, you know, work out where young people are struggling and they might be struggling personally. Or you can also start to work out where actually the whole class hasn't got a concept. And that allows you to reflect and think, well, maybe that as a teacher, Maybe I've delivered that in the wrong way. I need to think about delivering that in a different way. So we can start then to use this data to inspire feedback and to, 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 to delve forward with you know, data driven sort of personalization. Um, I suppose the other important thing when we sort of think about this is just for us to sort of think a little bit about, you know, what do we want young people to learn? Um, and again, many education systems around the world at the moment are wrestling with this idea of um, skills versus knowledge. Now, actually, in, in many ways, the two are completely you know, inter, inter, interrelated and it's far too much of a simplistic argument to talk about skills you know, and to talk about just knowledge you know, as, as, as a whole. Um, but, you know, the whole skills agenda is very, very important. And we tend to find that many, many curriculums around the world are knowledge heavy around that and don't always develop the skills that, that, that we need. So just rethinking about skills and what skills that we need are important. Um, and there are many, many different skills frameworks, you know, you know, for this. This is an example here from the World Economic Forum around, around, around that. Um, we've got our own skills framework in Scotland. You're likely to have your own skills framework in, you know, in Romania, certainly around industry, you know, around, around that. But they're mostly kind of all, all, all the same. But again, a, a useful sort of challenge, I think, to teachers and for people to work with children is, is that when we think about the important skills, how, did, how does technology support the development of these, of these skills? Um, because it's not just, you know, data literacy, which is obviously has got a very, very strong uh, you know, technology fo focus there. When we think about other skills such as communication and creativity, you know, and sense making, thinking about how does technology support these things? 
Because, of course, if I take communication, for example, many people just think that's speaking or they think that's listening. But how do I do that well with technology and without technology? And, of course, in, two, in 2023, both of these concepts are you know, incredibly important, particularly when you get into the workplace, particularly when you're, when you're trying to go for an interview. So I suppose the biggest question is, um, I suppose, then what do, we, what do we want people to learn? You know, or how do we want people to learn? Um, and I suppose when we think about, you know, different sort of rich experiences these days, um, it, it's not just when people being told, you know, about any of these things. Uh, and we can take aspects of different curricula around the world, which tend to be sort of quite you know, knowledge heavy. Uh, and it's not just about being told about these things, but it's actually how do we learn about these things through different rich experiences. And of course, technology, you know, can help us do that, you know, in really interesting, you know, and imaginative ways. And this is why... I often believe that we need a refocus on pedagogy here. Now, the simple truth of it is, is that is that good pedagogy with technology is exactly the same as good pedagogy without technology. But what I often find in terms of the starting point is that people don't always understand what good pedagogy is like in the first place. They might understand a good way to be able to direct instruction to children and young people, but they don't always understand how do we get that learning to become deep around that? How do we create these joyful learning experiences? Um, and in a lot of the work that I do, and I noticed that there was a, a, a at least one presentation yesterday on, on learning through play and, and, link, and linking this, this, this together, I, I believe, you know, my philosophical belief is around kind of active pedagogies. I think these are really, really important for young people to, you know, to, to, to learn and to enjoy school. Uh, and getting young people to enjoy school is an important thing because that does break, you know, poverty cycles over over time. It takes a long time, but it does do there. And if I think about great learning, you know, and what great learning is, I think that these five characteristics uh, are really, really important to it. So it's about, first of all, creating meaningful experiences with and without technology, making sure that young people are actively engaged in their learning. Now, technology can do that in different ways, partly because technology can provide a more personalized experience for young people. But also partly, of course, because young people find technology appealing, which means it can provide an initial hook to a task as well. Now, that's that's a that's only a starting point. That's not the only reason to use technology, but it can be a good hook to get young people involved to allow them to go deeper. We know that the best learning is social. This doesn't mean that young people always have to learn in groups around that uh, or learn in pairs. But it could also mean young people sharing their learning at the end of it, because that's also a social experience and building up communication as well. I mean, and getting and that allows young people to get feedback, an incredibly important thing. Um, we know that the best learning is iterative, as in we build on it over time. We're allowed to make mistakes. We can go back. We can think about it. We can build on this learning over time um, as we build on knowledge, the basic principles of constructionism. And also we want you know, young people to have a really joyful time when they're, you know, when they're in schools. And and by joyful, I don't mean fun necessarily. I'm not, I think that learning is actually a pretty hard thing to be able to do. I don't think the schools have to be fun all the time, but actually, if you want young people to be able to achieve, you want them to feel that kind of sense of accomplishment. And for me, that's more of a sense of joy in terms of making, making that work as well. So how do we get these things? Now, I haven't just made all of these things up. This comes from, you know, cognitive science around like how people uh, how people learn in different in different in different contexts. I just sort of tried to simplify the model, you know, a little a little bit more. But again, it's thinking about how do we do these five things with and without technology. Uh, and again, just a, a kind of publication that was wanting to wanting to sort of recommend to to, pe to, to people here, and I'll explain a little bit more at the moment. Is there's a great book by uh, by my friend Mike Sharples, who was a professor at the Open University, um, and he's written a book on on practical pedagogies. And this is thinking, uh, this is beyond the sort of the normal classroom tools. And he's talking about some of the big pedagogical concepts here around personalization, connectivity, reflection, extension tasks, embodiment, you know, and, and scale. Uh, and he's picked up, if you like, 40, like, if you like, emerging big pedagogies that, that are here. And the reason that I mention this is that um, in Mike's book, which I think is very, very good, it's first of all, it's very, very simply written. It's easy to under, it's easy, easy to understand. But within each section, he talks about how might this pedagogy be built on uh, with technology as well. So he looks at it without technology and then he purposely looks at it within technology as well. Now, the other reason that I mention this is that this book is based on um, a series called Innovative Pedagogies from the Open University. Uh, and this Innovative Pedagogies from the Open University is completely free. So you can go onto the Innovative Pedagogies website, 
and you can download the, the reports and you can basically, you know, read version of Mike's book, you know, as, as, as a result of this for free. Um, and it's available in, in multiple, you know, different languages uh, and it's all open source, which means it's available through Google, Google Translate. So again, if you're interested in these bigger pedagogies and how we drive things forward, I think this will be an interesting thing to kind of look at. Let's just go back to skills a second, because I think this, again, this is important. And let's maybe have a little think about um, creativity, because I think creativity is uh, something that we, all, that we don't always un un understand. And maybe we can kind of pose this question, because I think most countries around the world, most teachers understand that creativity is important around that. Uh, and it's interesting to sort of pose the question around, well, how do we how do we teach creativity? Well, um, again, we know a lot more about creativity than we did 10 years ago. And um, again, there are different viewpoints on it. But most people will agree that we 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 teach creativity by getting young people to create things, by, by getting young people to, 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 to build things. This this process of constructivism developed by um, Seymour Papert, you know, in the in the first instance, who sadly passed away. In, 20, in, 20, in 2016. But the reason that I mention this is that, of course, in the modern world, this isn't just about building things with uh, Lego blocks or with cardboard. This is also about how do we build things with digital technology to be able to develop the kind of creative ex ex experience. And we know that there are certain technologies that allow people, the young people to do this well. So there are things, for example, like systems-based robotics, where where the that allow the young people to build different types of robots to solve a problem, so that the class aren't building all the same robot to solve the same problem. But they need that, that kind of freedom and agency as part of that. We know that um, making and tinkering, you know, that the idea of thinking with your hands, using cardboard, using basic electronics, basic engineering skills to try and solve problems, is very very conducive to this developing of the creativity experience. Um, and then there's also things like creative coding, such as Scratch. And I think that there's a workshop on Scratch, you know, later today, this idea of taking building blocks and encouraging children and young people to, you know, build their own stories, games and animation. So if we're really serious about trying to develop creativity in young people, we need to think about how do we do that with, you know, appropriate technologies, um, you know, you know, you know, as well. And tools like Scratch, um, uh, other uh, things like system based ro 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 robotics and very, very simple, basic tools like uh, making and tinkering are all also an important part of that. For those educators on the call that are, that are interested in Scratch and have, and, have, and have done work with Scratch, and I personally think that Scratch is a good cross curricular tool. It's not just the domain you know, of the computer science teacher. I just wanted to mention Octa Studio. Um, I don't know whether you've, you've seen, seen, seen this yet. This was um, a, a new, a brand new resource, which is free. Um, which was which was launched by the MIT Media Lab just 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 last week. Uh, from so they're they're the, they're the creators of Scratch, and it's basically like a, a, an app that you can download <clears throat> for Android uh, or for the Apple Apple I Apple iPhone. Um, you can see from the screen there if you're familiar with Scratch, you've got the different building blocks that you can use. But it also uses the capacity, like within your phone as well, to turn on the light, turn off the light, use the accelerometer behind it, and it's been developed really. Um, because Scratch isn't a great tool to use on a small on a, on a, on a small on a small screen, and of course, because it's a downloadable app, once you've developed it, you can also use this offline, you know, as well to sort of try and make it work. So, if you're interested in kind of computer science, this idea of of, of making and tinkering, um, and if you're in a school where perhaps you don't have a lot of technology, but young people have access to mobile phone technology, then again, this is a really interesting tool to sort of use. And it was just launched um, last week, and it's growing. Uh, popularity quite 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 quickly and um i think that's interesting because as one of the creators of scratch and the creators of octa studio mitch resnick would, would would say it's not about screen time it's about what you do with that screen time so young people can be passive consumers of information but actually rather than talking about reducing screen time why don't we talk about increasing creativity time and tools like scratch and octa studio you know a really really good way to be able to do that so I think that there are other also, you know, um, creative approaches to technology as well. Um, and it would be good to see some of these things uh, more and more and more and more in schools. Now, I know that this is problematic, you know, some, sometimes. Um, but I think that uh, like a number of a number of years ago, some of these things were certainly quite popular in the UK. But we've we moved quite heavily to this kind of productivity, you know, section quite often under the pressure of commercial suppliers. So for me, it's time to sort of try and get that needle back the other way. So productivity is important. You know, being able to type and to do presentations and to use spreadsheets is important. But actually to be able to do more creative, playful things with technology is important as well. Things like 
the use of moving image, sound, you know, digital images. I mean, I find digital images fascinating because all kids now can take digital photos. They take hundreds of digital photos, but actually a lot of them aren't very good. <laughs> so there's actually that part about how do we teach and work with young people to take digital images properly, you know, around that? How do we work with that? Thinking about things like animation, uh, thinking about things like uh, writing for the web to give young people audience, that social interaction that we were talking about in terms of the importance of um, pedagogies, thinking about things like um, even using basic technologies like spreadsheets and presentations in a, in a creative you know, and an imaginative way. And then, folks, you remember at the, start, at the start, I said that it's important to sort of focus a little bit on the, ba on the, on the basics here. So um, I suppose one of the one of the interesting things that we quite often sort of find in schools, and we find this in schools all around the world, is that some of the most basic skills we don't do well. You know, so actually, you know, teaching young people to be able to search the Internet, you know, or to use chatbots, you know, appro appropriately are things that young people don't do well. Um, they then quite often get information that comes back, which can be misinformation because they're not able to use the skills to see whether it's coming from a reliable source or not. They're not able to kind of cross exam examine it. So actually going back and really focusing on some of these basic skills to give young people good digital literacies is an important thing. And this is an important part of pedagogy. This is the, the, you know, if you like, the foundations of good pedagogy. And then I suppose, you know, in schools as well, we've also got a role to prepare young people for lifelong learning. And you know, without a doubt, you know, when young people leave school um, and go on to get a job or to go to university and when they eventually leave university, most of their learning after that will probably be online around that. So actually, what is the role of schools to help young people learn in a structured, you know, online way? How do we do that? Because young people are good at learning about things that they're interested in around that from YouTube, etc. But taking part in a, a longitudinal course you know, is, is harder. It's a different skill set. And we certainly find um, in many parts of Europe and in the United States is that young people and adults enroll in online courses, but there's a really, really high drop off rate as a result of that because they don't have the skills to be able to persevere with it in the first place. It's not all interest around it. So what is the role in schools of supporting that lifelong agenda to help and teach young people to learn in a structured you know, online way? And of course, we did a lot of that during COVID. But now we've regressed and we're not always teaching these skills as we need to. So I think we need to revisit that. Um, this obviously would include things like you know, self-directed learning. Um, I've mentioned already the importance of being able to do basic Internet search. Um, but this might also be as well where we need to start thinking about how do we think about more advanced search tools such as ChatGPT, um, such as Google Bed, which has got, you know, artificial intelligence now built in, such as Microsoft Bing, which has got this. And how are we, um, you know, asking, how are we getting young people to interact with these technologies? And of course, all of these technologies, including Internet search, work the best when you ask the right questions. If you ask simple questions, you'll get simple answers. And in the, the vein of artificial intelligence, we call that prompt craft. You know, we're thinking about what are the prompts that we want to ask the artificial intelligence to get an appropriate answer in order for that to come back. So again, this is a very, very kind of basic skill around things. It's a new skill, really, in terms of how we do it. But something that we need to be introducing, I think, you know, into, into, our, into our school sooner rather than later. Um, and I say, I'm not going to talk too much about you know, artificial intelligence in this, in this thing here, but um, I did want to sort of show this graph because I think it is interesting. Um, and I think it's interesting you know, for countries uh, like Scotland and like Romania that's had a bit of a focus on STEM education you know, for the last, you know, for the last number, number of years and, and computer science. And of course, what's interesting about this is that if you look at these graphs here, and it's obviously a, a, a graph from, from the US, but we can see um, you know, the cost of computers, the CPU, that's come down over time, you know, as computers have got huge from taking up huge rooms to sort of smaller rooms. Um, the cost of, of bandwidth inter internet connectivity has come down over time. That's why most of us have now got it in our homes. The cost of storage has gone from big physical data centers to cloud computing. That's, that's come down. And of course, what we're starting to see, interestingly enough, is that software engineers, computer programmers, you know, the cost of these are starting to come down now because some of the basic computer programming is being replaced by artificial intelligence around that. So there's some interesting, you know, interesting things here, I think, for countries like Scotland and Romania to wrestle with around that, because there's still a place for computer programming. Um, but actually, now that some of the simple programming can be done by prompts as a result of that, 
it's more about the imagination of making sure that you get these prompts right. So these are just important things, I think, for us to wrestle with. Now, I'm often asked um, about resources for teaching artificial intelligence in school. I, I, I think that some of the best resources for this at the moment um, come from the MIT Media Lab. Um, they, th they think about artificial intelligence in a, in a kind of really kind of playful way. They've developed curriculum from the personal robotics group for very, very young children. I'm talking three, four year olds, you know, all the way up to, you know, our older children, 16, 17 and, and, eight, and 18 year olds. And again, there's a link there around that, which we can also, you know, share in the chat or when we sort of share the slides. But again, this is an interesting bit of curriculum. I think you can explore. Again, it's all open source. It can go through Google Translate. It might not be perfect, but, you know, I think it provides a really, really nice um, tool set. So as I sort of get towards the end of the presentation in terms of what I was wanting to say, um, I guess the big questions that I'm posing here is, you know, for, for us in schools and education systems is, first of all, what, what do we want children to learn? That's the important thing. What, what do we want them to learn and why, and why do we want them to learn that around that? So it's not just about curriculum. It's also there also needs to be that needs to be values based. Um, then there's for me, there's a question about. So if we understand what we want children to learn, how do we want them to learn it? What's the best way for them to learn it in, a, in an active way? Thinking about those five characteristics of learning, thinking about how technology can support and augment that around that. And then I suppose it's thinking about, well, now we know how we want children to yearn, to learn. What are the sorts of pedagogies, some of which that I've mentioned I've mentioned there, are needed to teach um, the, the, the age of the children, the stage of the children, the subject around that? And how do I support that, you know, with, you know, and without and without tech and without without technology. So it's been a bit of a kind of whirlwind around some of the things. I hope there's a sort of few links with different things there. I think we managed to sort of cover most of the bits that we sort of set out to at the you know at the start at the, at the start at the start of the day. So we've talked a little bit about getting the future wrong, and that's okay. But let's get the part, let's get the present right or as right as we can on, on that. That sort of steer around. Let's not embrace the, the the biggest most exciting shiny technology let's think about what are the appropriate technologies first so there are disruptive technologies such as artificial intelligence we need to embrace that but how do we use that well how do we think about digital transformation between schools and and, and home and how do we use uh young people's own devices to help us do that around that I mentioned doctor studio which is, again is a powerful tool in here thinking about technology in learning rather than technology for le for learning so what do we want to learn? What are the technologies that are appropriate for that? What are the internet technologies that are appropriate for that? This idea of building strong digital communities with these practical pedagogies, these big pedagogies, not just one-off tools. How do we get things to become deep learning? And then a few thoughts on creativity and that idea of you know, making and tinkering and constructing and thinking about how we do that with technology. Because actually, when we think about STEM and computer programming moving forward, we need people to be creative thinkers as well as computational thinkers now because the technology can do the computational bit but we'll start to get our most creative products going forward if we combine computation you know with create with creativity uh, and i suppose my sort of final thought on this really is that uh it's a huge agenda like education's hard like it's really really hard around that and it's really really hard because we've got you know 30 40 kids in front of us every single day there's competing pressures in terms of pandemics that we've all been through in recent in, in recent years cost resources challenges that young people have at home around so everything's got to be you know in, in balance but i do think that technology can sort of quite um can quite un unlock this so i suppose my, my sort of challenge and provocation is, is, a, is, is to think about some of what i've said hopefully it's been a bit of a provocation it's a real mixed audience today but what will you go away and think about and i'll just leave you with one sort of final thought which i use a lot is that um, I don't think that, that technology is necessarily going to make teaching easier, um, but I certainly think it's got the potential to make it different. So I think a really, really good sense check with some of these things is that if I'm using the technology to do the same things that I've always done, am I really unlocking the transformational power of technology to sort of try and make this work? So my challenge is, of course, is how do we uh, how do we move the needle to start to do more interesting things with technology? And if you think about those three cartoons that I showed you at the start, then actually the technology was being used to deliver old pedagogical processes as a result that people were still sat in rows, there was still a blackboard, the teacher was still at the front. How can we use the technology now to start to change that? And it's not going to happen overnight or next week or next month, but how do we do that just to slowly move that needle um, over time? So um, 
I will stop there. Um, I think we've probably got a bit of time for questions and like really happy for people to reach out on Twitter or whatever whatever you use. And um, and yeah, I'll share the slides with uh, with Eleanor and, and the organizers afterwards. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Oli, for this wonderful presentation. I've, uh, I'm, I was reading comments that people felt like they were in the pedagogy course again, and they felt very good, you know, very good about it. And um, I have a lot of uh, reflections. I have some worries from uh, teachers. I did my own reflective process while I was listening to you because I was thinking, you know, like, especially about this around this idea of how hard it is to define good pedagogy. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's because we feel that it needs to be so complicated, isn't it? Yes. So we feel yeah. just because we put good or excellent in front of it, then it needs to be like, I don't know, it needs to be not necessarily shiny, but it needs to be um, spectacular. Maybe that's the yeah. word, you know, good pedagogy needs to be spectacular. And it isn't yeah. like this because even though the technology has changed around us, how the brain works hasn't yes. fundamentally changed. I mean, we still have... I don't know, perceptions and representations at the basis of everything of how the brain learns. So you still need people to touch things, to understand how the world works. Um, and I was thinking that maybe, you know, some of the, uh, some of this we lose when we start working with uh, all the children, you know, mm -hmm. because when you work with small children, you have this, uh, I think I would say grounding Yep. You know, grounding pedagogy because they ground you with their yep. age and how they learn. But then when they got a bit early, older, you just think that mm, now that they have a prefrontal cortex in development, ah, they can do a lot of abstract things, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I was thinking about this idea of uh, good pedagogy. Why do we think, why do we always need, why do we always need to be, you know, to do spectacular things? To be to consider the pedagogy that we see in front of us good pedagogy. Yeah, so so it's a great it's a great question. Like around like like around, and you, and, you, and you've said you said lots of interesting things there. So so I think so I think first of all I don't think we talk about this enough. And I, and I said it at the end of the present. I mean, teaching's hard. <laughs> work working working with young people is 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 hard. And I think the sooner we admit that, <laughs> and the sooner that we realise it's hard, and the sooner that we build networks like, like you've built with this conference mm -hmm. here to be able to get mutual support and to share ideas that's when it starts to get a little bit easier because you realize that you're all in it together you know around around around, around that um and i think the other thing that we need to remember is that because teaching's hard is that we can't always deliver excellent lessons all of the time or excellent days of learning all of the time around, around that but actually, what we can do is that we can get some of those basics right to do the mm. best that we can at that at, the, at that time. And we can follow, you know, a few basic principles to help us to help help, help us do that. So those those five characteristics that I mentioned, there are you know, a, a, a basic principles. Now, there's a lot of very, very complex learning science, you know, behind, but, you know, but, but, but behind that. But actually, if we are thinking a little bit more about is the learning meaningful, were the kids actively engaged? Did they enjoy it? You know, at, at 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 the end, is it socially active? And are we building on previous learning? Then that's quite a good 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 way, a good sort of sense check. Now, one of the challenges with that, and I'm sure this is the same in Romania because it's certainly the same in Scotland, is that teachers know this, and they know this through training. And actually, it's common sense; it makes sense because that's how we learn best. But we often don't have time at the end of a lesson or at the end of the day to think right. Let's take those five things. How did I do so that I can work to get a little bit better last time? So one of the biggest challenges that we've got at the moment globally in education is allowing is allowing that reflection space for teachers to be able to step back, you know, and to evaluate their own practice, you know, you know, you know, on, 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 on that. Um, I think the comment that you made around like older children, younger children, like is a really important is a really, really important thing as well. And of course, what we find um in, in many countries, and, I, and I'm sure Romania is the, is the same here, is that the the upper curriculum in secondary schools and high schools in particular is normally driven by high stakes examinations at the end of the, of the school. And they tend to be 
very or, very content -heavy. or by yeah. this pressure of um, of being integrated in the work market immediately after school yes. i think it's high stakes exam but also this like this productivity pressure you were talking about yeah. so i yeah. think this is a driver and it has become like more and more obvious until yeah. the like the small uh, grades of the secondary yeah. schools so, so what so what so what you and, and this is a challenge around this because what because so because of those pressures as you say, you end up with a backwash on the curriculum. So, so, so actually, you know, you find out that your 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 lower secondary school curriculum starts to look a bit like your higher secondary school curriculum, and your upper primary curriculum starts to look a bit like your secondary curriculum, and then your early years curriculum suddenly you've got children sat in rows learning and writing, and these rather than sort of playing, you know, and and, and developing. Now, the challenge with that, of course, is that the only way that we will solve that is by changing the assessment system. And changing assessment systems in countries takes a long period of time and people have got to lean into it to sort of try and make it happen. Now, there is some interesting things happening in Scotland. That's a lot of my work at the moment, working on assessment and other things where where, where we understand that, that subjects and pathways are important. Mm. But we're working towards a system where um, in, in, so this is a system we're working towards in Scotland. Or, so we're not we're not there yet, whereas actually in the senior school. You know, young people will will over time now be assessed on their ability to engage with project based learning and interdisciplinary learning. Um, and also uh, there'll be a notion around young people's own sort of personal pathways that they that they do as well. And the, and the idea behind that is to sort of try by changing the assessment methodology that that will cause a backwash on the curriculum to actually get some of these more kind of creative things in. So. So that, that you know, I, I, I think this is a challenge and and, and unfortunately, we 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 are, the countries and teachers are under a great deal of pressure because of the way that we assess like at the moment in the in the, mm. in the senior phase we need to work towards sort of challenging that you know a, yeah. a, a, a little bit more and that's not an easy thing to do you have anticipated my question and probably also worry about of uh, most of our teachers like uh, you know how doing creativity doing uh, you know learning that is enjoyable by by students and all sorts of things like this it's so hard you know it's so hard to prioritize this when the yeah. entire evaluation system is so driven actually by knowledge not necessarily yeah. not even by skills so there is this, this huge gap between the let's say the public discourse that we have around the world about how we want to build skills and 21st century yeah. skills and everybody talks about creativity you know like all the ministry of education everywhere they have yeah. a speech about creativity somewhere you know and yeah. then how hard it is then to do this in schools when you have evaluations and high stakes exams that are so focused on you know needing to deliver specific information and specific things and yeah. sometimes there's also the interest of different private partners that need specific yeah. things to be reflected in evaluation and i think it's uh it's it's for some teachers and i think some some feel maybe some other I don't know partners training partners from the NGO sector that they are moving against the core current you know like it's so hard when this the entire evaluation system works somehow against you and mm -hmm. against this yep. idea of what you're trying to build in the classroom how would you I don't know in, in your case how you how do you advise teachers to to navigate this uh, uh, complicated balance between the fact that I mean, kids do need to perform an evaluation because it's very important for their lives. Actually, it's yeah. not the it's it's not just for a grade, yeah. you know. Like it's it's consequential and it's very consequential in some instances. So, so I, so I, so, so you're right, and it, and it and it is and it is hugely problematic, you know, around around around, around that. Um, um, and of course, depending on the culture of your school or your municipality, then it can be even more. Problem, 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 problematic. So, my our our advice certainly when we're working with 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 with, with schools is is to is to, is first of all to think carefully around how do you how do you create some of the time and space for some of these things to happen. Mm -hmm. So, if because of external pressures, for example, examinations, you can't. You, it will be impossible to move towards a model where it could happen in every lesson, and that's the reality in some places. How do you create time and space? within the week or within a month or within or at a point in the year for young people to be able to engage in some of these activities because because that is possible you know around that that is possible to take a day or these all these different things to be able to, to to do that and i think that sometimes people say things well that's a day that young people aren't learning it's like well young people aren't learning for a day because they've got a cold and they haven't come to school you know they're doing they're doing other things you know or actually young people continue to learn during the pandemic in a really way but they but many missed missed weeks before 
the online learning came in. So actually, that is possible. That's just a cultural thing to be able to. So, mm. it's, so there, are, so there are little steps I think around some of these other bits. And then what I what I say to you know for te for teachers and and in particular school principals that 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 have re that have realised that actually the the system that they're working in is is no longer fit for purpose, but they have to still work within that system. Mm. Is I quite often use the analogy of a of a children's colouring, and if you imagine the outline of that children's colouring is the system around mm -hmm. that. And you imagine if you're a young child and you're sort of colouring that in, is that you need to do most of what you're doing within the lines, but it's okay to go out of the lines around that. And as long as you only go out of the lines a little bit, rather than out of the lines a lot, you probably won't get noticed, which means it's going to be a better experience for the kids, you know, mm -hmm. but also be a better experience for you around that as well. Like we, we, we know from all around the world that if teachers are using more creative approaches, if young people have got more agency, if you're really working on interdisciplinary really projects, is that the people that benefit from the most is actually not the kids, it's the teachers. <laughs> it, you know, we've, we've got like surveys where teachers are, well, I, know I want to come to school now, it's given my job purpose around this, I'm not having to teach these young people meaningless, like meaning, meaningless, meaningless things, which so is hugely good for morale, you know, you know, as well. So my advice to, you know, for, for, for principals that want to push it a little bit is just start colouring outside those lines, you know, a, you know, a, 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 a little bit. Um, and then, of course, to change the system over time, as, as you know, I suppose how we've got permission to do that in Scotland now, now mm -hmm. that that then starts to come actually interestingly from things like parental pressure, you know, who then say, well, actually, the education system is not fit for purpose. What are you going to do about it? You know, around that. So it's hugely complex, you know, around that. But uh, I think a lot of it comes down to just you've just got to do as much as much as you can following, you know, your 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 your, your heart in terms of what's right for children and young people. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Oli. Um, I have also some very specific questions about like the use of um, artificial intelligence. I, I know mm -hmm. we said we will not talk about it, but like uh, some questions are um, about this and especially like teachers are worried about two things. First of yeah. it was this idea that maybe if uh, students, uh, you know, start using chat GPT, uh, they are not learning things, you know, that yeah. like they are not... Uh, they are not learning things, and then some teachers of ours are uh, are thinking like, do mm, should I use ChatGPT in any way? You know, they are thinking like, yeah. do I need to do that? Do I don't? Does it? Does is it good? Is it not good? Should I do it? Should I not do it? Like, how how do you navigate yourself this uh, these questions? Yeah. So so again, these these are these are great questions, and these these are all things that we're all wrestling with, like a little mm. bit at the moment. So so. I'll answer a slightly different question first because I think this is this is this is important. And, and one of one of the things is around um in you know in terms of in terms of equity and equity in education is is important. Mm. There are literally and we and we, and we know this. You, you can just look at the data with how many young how many people are using ChatGPT at, at, at the moment. Now now a lot of those are young people. Right? So we so we need to we need to accept that. And actually, a chunk of those kids. Out of those, those things, and we, we, you know, we're talking millions and millions of users around that. A chunk of those will be kids in Romania. <laughs> a chunk of those will be kids in Scotland are, around that. Now, um, so actually, if we're thinking about equity with the powerful of the, the, these tools, we're not going to stop, as we've seen everything else. We're not going to stop these young people using these tools. We might be able to stop it in school at that time via sort of punitive measures, but young people will still use these things outside of school or under the table. Those things. So actually, if we really want equity. Then it's about actually introducing all young people, you know, to these tools, which at the moment are free at the point of need, as long as you've got connectivity and as long as you've got a device. That's the way that we introduce equity around it. If if not, of course, what will happen is that some young people will continue to use these tools, and we know from very very early data these tends to be young people that have come from privilege, mm -hmm. tend to have more supportive parents, parents that are talking about some of these issues a little bit more. So our young people that come from more um, put from poorer backgrounds, more deprived backgrounds, without that kind of family support, who typically are further behind in school anyway, will continue to get further behind around this. So this is about an upskilling, I think, of all children around some of these tools. First of all, that's a that's an interesting sort of concept ar ar around that. There is the bit around like le like le like learning, and you know, um, we, we, but we have been here before. Like we we were here before about fifteen years ago. You know, when Wikipedia first came online. And you would set an essay for students to do, and they would basically hand in Wikipedia around, around that. But but the interesting thing is, is that we noticed 
like as prof as professionals we noticed that around around that and young people weren't rewarded we gave feedback that wasn't appropriate you know we talked about sources and referencing and these and these sorts of things so so i think that as a teacher if you're communicating with young people on a day by day basis you get a sense of how they're doing where they are with their age and stage and these sorts of things and then if you set a home learning task you know or or an essay in class and it's and it's written to the same level as a harvard law graduate you know you as a teacher are going to know that that's that's the case so that becomes a learning point ar ar around that so there's, there's there's a so in terms of basic pedagogy and the professionalism of teachers i think that can solve mm -hmm. that now the bit about should we use chat gbt ourselves around that now i've been doing i mean a lot of just because it's popular we didn't really talk about it today but mm -hmm. we could i mean we could have done a whole day on artificial intelligence yeah. <laughs> around, and, and, and like let's do that because that would be fun to do but you know like but you know you know, so so using these tools a lot, working with head teachers a lot, answering exactly these sort of questions is a lot. But it but it wasn't until about two weeks ago, apart from preparing for presentations and showing what it could do, it wasn't until about two weeks ago, and I was doing a piece of work that I suddenly thought, I'm going to use ChatGPT to give me a hand <laughs> with, with 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 this, and and I don't know why that had that's taken me a while to be able to do that because I've been immersed in these tools now for sort of several months but it hadn't ever sort of translated into my kind of work mm -hmm. but maybe I thought I was cheating around, around this mm -hmm. and it wasn't that I got the technology to write the report or do any of these sorts, 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 sorts of sorts of sorts of bits for me but where I was struggling with a couple of bits I asked chat GPT with some good prompts it gave me something which I kind of wanted which I was then able to adapt to sort of make it make it make it my own and it probably you know saved me several hours of time to be mm -hmm. able to do to be able to do that and I've shared that story a lot with my colleagues and the Ministry of Education and with, and with the government. And what I find is that actually, despite being immersed in technology, I'm a late adopter. Everybody's <laughs> doing this you know, around, uh, around this. So, so my my point to the audience and the question coming out is: have an experiment with some of the, with, with mm -hmm. some of these things, but take the time to become good at what we call the prompt craft to ask the right mm -hmm. questions to make to make that work. O otherwise, you know, you'll you, you put in the wrong questions, you'll get the wrong answers back. The same with internet search, you know, around that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. I think we could do, we could do this. Like, we, we definitely we should do a day in the festival only with you only and discuss all these things like in various sessions. You know, the session, the pedagogy session, the chat GPT session, yeah. the, the Lego <laughs> session, the Scratch session. Thank you so much, so so thank much for, for being here today. I will switch quickly to Romanian just for a couple of uh, uh, announcements for the next session, and then I will give it back here. Um, vă mulțumim foarte, foarte mult că ați stat chiar și după ce s-a terminat sesiunea, s-a terminat această conversație senzațională cu, cu Oli. Um, astăzi este o zi plină cu două serii de sesiuni de pe două scene și cu aniversare Meet and Code și și cu închiderea festivalului. Deci mă grăbesc să vă las timp pentru o scurtă pauză de ecran și ne vedem de la fix în curând. Vă mulțumesc foarte mult că ați fost în această dimineață la această conversație care cel puțin pe mine m-a pus pe gânduri. O zi spornică în continuare. Ne 